We really appreciate you spending your morning with us. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Dr. Megan Stead. I'm the Assistant Dean for External Relations at the UCCS College of Business. And one of my roles is to oversee our executive education programming, and that is why I am here with you all today. So before we begin, I just want to take a moment to talk about the partnership between UCCS and the Chamber and EDC. So the goal of these business briefings is to bridge the gap between research and application. So we identify a faculty member at UCCS who is well versed in the topic at hand, and we match them with a chamber member who is engaged in the area of interest. So this overlap of research and application provides you with really unique and comprehensive perspectives of the topic, which today happens to be navigating through communication barriers. And lastly, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the offerings available through the UCCS Executive Education Program. So you'll get a little taste of what our faculty members can do um, today, but we offer training programs for business professionals. So we can develop a customized training program on a business topic uh, for, for your organization, or we have several open enrollment programs uh, that you, you can use for professional development opportunities. And this fall, we will be um, planning our mini MBA program to relaunch. We had to cancel it last fall to COVID, but we're really hoping to bring that back here um, in fall of 2021, and we're really excited about that. So after today's session, if you feel that your organization could benefit from additional training, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to develop a customized uh, training program for you. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Danny, uh, from the Chamber and EDC, and she's going to introduce today's topic as well as our speakers. Danny. Thanks, Megan. Good morning, everyone. I'm Danny Barger. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Communications for the Chamber and EDC. And uh, this topic is near and dear to my heart. Obviously, um, navigating through communication barriers is very important professionally and person in your personal lives and whatnot. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to my colleague, Andrea Mensink. She's our communications manager, and she is uh, she leads the newsletters and external communications that many of you hopefully see in your inbox and read every piece of information that we share with you all. Um, now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, first, we have Jamie Fabos, who's Chief Communications Officer for the City of Colorado Springs. Jamie has been in her role since 2015 and served two terms under Mayor Southers. She leads fun things like the Olympic City USA branding and has also done not as fun things, uh, leading PR through several emergency activations. Um, Jamie is a total rock star. We get to work together a lot on lots of projects and um, sharing a unified voice. And most recently, Space Command has been a, a topic that we're constantly texting back and forth on. So thanks, Jamie, for all your collaboration. And then our other speaker is Matt Lyle, who I just met briefly uh, prior to the Zoom call. Matt's the Assistant Professor of Management at UCCS College of Business. He has a doctorate degree in organization studies from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and a master's degree in industrial and organizational psychology from Salem State University. Uh, I also just found out that he has recently been locked in, a, in his basement and he likes to save cats from trees, although that one might be false, but hopefully you read everybody's full bio on their website. Uh, with that, I'm going to kick it to Matt and let you take it away. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining today. As uh, you just said in that lovely introduction, my name is Matt Lyle. Um, I have been a doctor for less than a year. I just got my doctorate in May and I started here at UCCS in the fall. So much like Emma, who I know started her job during the pandemic, uh, it's been a strange little bit of time, but I have fallen in love with Colorado Springs immediately. I'm a bit of a runner, so I enjoy going out on the trails and seeing all of the nature I can, and I can't wait to go inside places um, once this has all passed. So thank you all for joining. I'm going to share my screen. And okay, I don't want that window. Yep, go away. Okay. And I'm going to maximize that. Can we see the slideshow presentation? Can I get some nods? Perfect, beautiful. All right, I'm gonna minimize all your faces. You all look beautiful, but I'm just gonna minimize so I can see. So I'm gonna take you through some of the uh, research on communication differences, specifically when it comes to gender and race. And I put a question mark there because I wanna talk a little bit about how much are these differences real and how much are they a little bit artificial or maybe only perceptual? 
So I'm going to give myself about 20 minutes. Um, I will try to stay under that. So a few notes before we start. First, I don't want this presentation to take the look of what I call the 90s stand-up routine. Men talk like this. Women talk like this. I, I don't want it to be that. There's a lot of research on men and women, minority versus majority. I'm going to be citing that research, but I don't want you to think that I think, because I certainly don't, that all men talk one way, all women talk one way. There is much more complexity to it than that. Gender is a continuum. Race and ethnicity are continuums. So there are some inherent limits to what we're going to be talking about here. I'm also going to be talking about generalizations based on research. So when I talk about, for instance, rapport talk versus report talk, yes, the 50th percentile of people who self-identify as women tend to engage in more rapport talk than report talk. That doesn't mean that that applies to you. It doesn't mean that it applies to me. We're just kind of going on averages here when we talk about most of these differences. And the obvious one, you saw me before we started here, I am a white male who identifies as heterosexual. So I am inherently limited in what I can say here. I'm going to be citing research when I talk about what I talk about, but you probably have, the people in this room have much more experience than I do. In my own class on communication, advanced communication topics, when we talk about gender and communication, I punt it to the women in the class and have them be the ones who are posting on the discussion boards and the guys are the ones listening because we often do far too much talking and telling. So I don't want you to feel like I am the end all be all expert here. You have your own experiences that are probably much more informed than what I'll say here. But that having been said, let's get going. So gendered communication, let's talk about differences. What are they? Are they real? Are they worth looking into? What can we learn from them? So as I just mentioned, when we talk about verbal communication differences between men and women, you might have heard these terms before, report talk and rapport talk. The former is generally attributed to men and the latter is generally attributed to women. So report talk consists of things like communicating information directly, consisting of friendly, sometimes aggressive banter, getting on each other's case a little bit, more advice driven, less empathetic, and tends to combine business talk and non-business talk. Going back to those stand-up routines, you've probably heard people tell jokes about the, the wife goes to the husband and says, hey, I have a problem, and he immediately wants to fix it. Or the man is in a business meeting, and they get to talking about the big game on Sunday for 10 minutes before they talk about anything business-related. These are things that, on average, are attributed more to men. On the other hand, you have rapport talk, which is more common amongst women. It includes generally more qualifiers, adding things like, I don't know, maybe, let me think about that. It's less authoritarian in that way. There tends to be more blame taking and more thanking. There's more, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Thank you, thank you for that point. And the focus tends to be a little bit more on relationship building than informational outcomes. This is what is sometimes referred to as troubles talk in the psychological literature, where women will want to talk to each other about the issues going on in their lives, not necessarily to fix them, but just to share them. So I pose the rhetorical question that I'll answer myself. And if you have questions afterwards, you know, I'll certainly take them. Which one is more effective? Well, neither really. If we look at research, for instance, on job interviews, we know that people get jobs not necessarily because of skill matching, but because of cultural matching. The more that you can convince the people you're talking to that you belong there, you share common interests, you'd be, to use a hackneyed phrase, someone they'd like to get a beer with, that's the person that they're going to hire. And elements of that are present much more in rapport talk. One big advantage of rapport talk is that it helps with relationship activities, which are something often left out of team building. Teams often jump right into something called task activities where they focus on, okay, we're in a group now. What do we need to produce? When do we need pr to produce it? Who's going to do what? But most teams fail because they don't engage in relationship activities, getting to know one another, getting to know each other's strengths, getting to know what kind of jokes you can tell with the other person, at what times you can contact the other person. If the person texts you back and says, okay, period, are they really mad at you or are they just not great at text communication? Learning these things is very important to a team. So having elements of report and rapport talk in a team, in a business, in any organization is incredibly valuable. 
And as I hinted at at the beginning, men and women engage in both of these. It just so happens that on average, women tend to engage in report doc a bit more. Well, let's think about nonverbal communication differences. I have here a photo from a, a really fun, you, you can tell I'm an academic because I think a study is fun, a fun study of powerful versus powerless posturing. On the top here, you have a visual depiction of what is considered high power posturing. People sitting with their hands on their hips, leaning back a bit. This is something that I tend to do consciously because my um, self-esteem deprived eighth grade self is always trying to act more important than I really am. So this is powerful posturing. On the bottom is powerless posturing, hands crossed, hand on the face kind of thing. Now in this particular study, they looked at the posturing of anesthesiologists and whether it would affect patients' perceptions, whether patients would think that the anesthesiologists were more capable, smarter, would take better care of them. And as you can probably guess, anesthesiologists that adopted these powerful postures had increases in all three. They were judged to be more trustworthy, smarter, would take better care of the patients. One important thing to note is that there was no significant differences with gender. So if women adopted these powerful poses, it they weren't judged to be, you know, we talk a lot about glass ceilings and those things certainly are real. Or when women do things that men do, they're judged to be more snippy and less uh, powerful. But we didn't see that in this study. So regardless of gender, adopting a powerful position was seen to be an advantage. Now, when we think about how women, and again, on average, position themselves as far as their nonverbal communication, they tend to adopt more powerless posturing. But as we just found out from that study, if they adopt more powerful posturing, they're not judged to be any less competent or trying to reach above their station or anything like that. Those you know, terrible stereotypes we live with in society. They're judged to be powerful people. The other three communication, nonverbal communication tendencies of women are all judged to be positive. If we go back again to the research on getting a job, gestures of agreement, gesture matching, meaning that if I'm sitting across the table from you and I'm using my hands a little bit more, you may use your hands a little bit more, and maintaining eye contact with the person you're talking with, all these things are present to greater degrees in women than they are to men. So it's not like when it comes to nonverbal communication, everything that men do is judged to be better, more competent, smarter. It's actually quite the opposite. And as I'll talk about in a bit, when I talk about takeaways from this, it's not so much, it, it's less informative to say, okay, you should behave more like a man or more like a woman when you communicate. It's more about knowing the things that are effective and doing those things. If you're a person, regardless of gender, who engages in more powerless posturing, but is solid on gesture matching, agreement gestures and eye contact, maybe work on your posture a bit. And regardless of gender, the outcome should be, not will be, but will increase your likelihood of being able to get across more easily to people. But I wanna give you some food for thought. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to play this video because audio sometimes messes up when I play it on my own screen. So I'm just going to talk through it briefly. If you haven't seen the movie Up in the Air, you should probably see the movie Up in the Air. It's a 2009 film. It stars Anna Kendrick, Vera Farmiga, George Clooney, J.K. Simmons, as you can see. Uh, my father, when my mother was alive, lived in constant fear that she would leave him for George Clooney. And I, I don't think I need to give any more reason to see a movie starring George Clooney. But in this film, George Clooney and Anna Kendrick play these characters who go around and fire people. It's their job to fire people. So it sounds like a fun job. So they go here to fire J.K. Simmons, the uh, bald guy that you can see right there. And after trying to cite some scientific facts about how losing his job will actually benefit his family, and Anna Kendrick tries that, George Clooney jumps in and says, you know, hey, I bet that your kids never respected you. Um, and he gets, hey, what the hell are you talking about? I thought you were trying to comfort me. And George Clooney says, well, I see on your bio that you like to cook and you probably took this job and you gave up on your dreams and you should try to chase your dreams and you should go back to school. And JK Simmons kind of nods in agreement and he leaves the meeting, not feeling great, but feeling better. And in one way you could walk away from that scene and say, wow, that human connection, that challenging, that's a really effective way to communicate. But here's my question to you. Um, can Natalie talk to JK Simmons character the way that George Clooney can? Could a woman talk to him that way and have it be judged to be a great conversation? Well, 
Probably not. If you have this middle-aged guy who has been in a position of power for all these years and grew up in a certain time, and a young female goes up to him and says, hey, you gave up on your dreams, you're a loser, you should probably try a different career, we can see how that might not go over as well. Well, why might that not go over as well? Well, because differences in communication between gender are not necessarily genetic, but rather reinforced over time. I don't need to tell people in this audience that we are raised to communicate in certain ways. And oftentimes, even when there's no difference between people, between how people are communicating, we judge them to be more or less competent based not on what they're saying, but the gender of the person that's saying it. The, the study that really hammers this home, some people might be familiar with this, it's the Working Well Female Study, which was a popular article on the internet a few years ago, where a male and a female coworker switched their email signatures. Every email the woman sent looked like it was coming from the guy. Every email the guy sent looked like it was coming from the woman. And here's the real power quote from that article. After noticing that a client was treating him like crap while his email signature was accidentally set to my name, says the woman, we came up with an experiment. We switched signatures for a week. Nothing changed except that our clients read me as male and Marty as female. I had one of the easiest weeks of my professional life. He didn't. He would send the same emails he would always, but with a female name in the signature, and he would be castigated for that. He would be told that he was trying to be someone he wasn't, that he was too forward, that he was too snippy, that he was too certain words that I probably can't say in an EDC presentation, but you know what they are. And she had a really easy week, regardless of what she sent, it was judged to be informative, direct and appropriate. And why is this? Well, it's because not we, it's not, let me back up a second, sorry about that. It's not because we communicate any differently, it's because that communication is judged to be different. So if we look at a list here, and this is just one of many studies that has covered the same thing. A man says something, a woman says something, the content is exactly the same. How do they perceive that communication? I'll just point out a few here. Women on average are judged to be less logical. Uh, men are judged to be less outspoken, women more outspoken, and women are judged to be more emotional. And these stereotypes shape reality. So when we encounter a man and a woman saying the same thing, we might judge that woman to be more emotional, even when she's not. I'll reach into my uh, nerd brain a little bit and bring up the character of Captain Marvel from the Marvel movies. If you've seen them, great. If you haven't, give it a look. It's a good movie. Captain Marvel is this character who in her standalone Marvel movie is incredibly stoic, never really shows any emotion, uh, very quippy, very fun, very snarky. And everyone in the movie keeps telling her that she's too emotional. Now, some critics judge this to be a bad portrayal by the actress Brie Larson. I think it actually goes a little bit deeper than that. I think it captures something that the men who reviewed this movie are not familiar with, which is you don't have to be emotional to be told that you're emotional. So what's some advice? I mean, I've, I started out with a picture of, hey, we talk different ways, but not really, everything's fine. And then I moved on to, hey, everything looks pretty grim. Well, what's some advice? How can we operate in this world given these realities? Well, some advice for communicators is to seek good scientific advice on best practices and tailor those practices as needed. It's not about saying, I need to talk more like a man, I need to talk more like a woman. It's about saying, okay, it, when someone is talking to me, maintaining eye contact is something important to do. So I should do that. It doesn't matter if I'm a man or a woman, that's something that I should try to do. Advice for listeners is where we try to break down some of these stereotypes. And I know this isn't easy, but if we can know these things and we can implement them in our daily lives as we listen to people communicate, we can start to make things easier for those communicators who are judged to be too emotional or too outspoken, even when they're objectively not. The first is to be mindful that there's more than one effective communication style. As I said, rapport talk and report talk both have places in interviews, in team meetings, in any organizational setting. You want to recognize that not all men and women adopt their prescribed communication patterns. What I don't want people to walk away from this meeting saying is, okay, when I talk to a woman, I should behave like this. When I talk to a man, I should behave like this. You need to get to know the people in your organization and talk to them as they want to be talked to. 
You want to recognize the benefits of diverse approaches to communication, especially when it comes to task and relationship activities. As I said earlier, and to use an analogy of a once very popular play, now very popular film, there is one thing to perform Hamilton on stage. It looks incredible. It's great. Anyone who disagrees, man, I don't know if we can get along now, but it's one thing to perform it on stage and nail it, but performing it on stage and nailing it comes from all the relationship activities amongst the cast and crew that allow them to perform that way. And it's the same in any organization. You want diverse approaches to communication. You don't want everyone talking the same way because you get different things out of different types of communication. Now, I want to say a brief bit about minority communication. And when I say minority here, I mean any minority group. If the majority of people in the organization are of one race and ethnicity, then the minority group is the one that is not in the majority. And I specifically want to speak briefly to how to improve what's called social cohesion, the trust and the bonds amongst the entire organizational collective. So what does the research say about communication differences between majority and minority groups? Well, minority groups often prefer approaches that recognize their distinctiveness. For example, Relative to majority group members, minority group members typically prefer multiculturalism over assimilation and dual identity over common identity. People from minority groups want their minority status to be recognized, want their group to be recognized, and don't want to be told you have to assimilate into our group. You have to behave like us. Minority groups are often more concerned with being respected than liked by majority group members and are more comfortable approaching them when they feel as if their minority identity is recognized. So I put up these photos here because there's this, hopefully at this point, outdated idea that we should take a colorblind approach to the world. That we should say, well, I don't see color, color doesn't matter, I treat everyone the same. And while that might be well-intentioned, as I'll say in a minute, the research backs up that that is the wrong approach. The better approach is to recognize these differences, appreciate these differences in order to, perhaps counterintuitively, enhance the cohesion between groups. So one interesting study had people from minority groups, mostly Black and Hispanic. It's a limitation of the study. That's obviously not every minority group, but had people read these newspaper clippings, which were written, they were told from the perspective of a white person about minority groups. So one group read this. A recent poll of non-Hispanic whites revealed that most whites perceive that whites have many things in common with the majority group. One white respondent noted, we may disagree at times, but we whites and the minority group in this country share so much in common. The results of the survey indicated that most whites now view whites and non-whites basically as sharing commonalities. So the point here is that the piece said we're all the same. We have a lot in common and we should focus on the things we have in common. And another group read this. A recent poll of non-Hispanic whites, same beginning, revealed that most whites perceive that whites should respect the views of minority groups. Given the position of minority groups in America, whites should listen to the views of minority groups. Whites should do a better job of listening, acknowledging the position of minority groups in this country and recognizing the opinions of those minority groups. Many whites perceive that minority groups have unique talents, abilities, and competence. The results of the survey indicated that most whites perceive that whites should approach minority groups with respect, listening, and recognizing the views of minority groups in America. From a 10,000 foot view or even a lower view than that, both of these might look fine. They both might look very respectful of a minority group. The first one is, hey, we have a lot in common and we should focus on that. The second one is, hey, there's some differences between us, but that's what makes us great. But there were serious differences, significant differences, when it came to how those pieces of communication were perceived. The results? Well, messaging acknowledging difference, that's the latter statement, were correlated with increased feelings of respect by minority group members, they felt more respected, increased positive attitudes towards the majority group, and, and especially important for organizational contexts, increased willingness to communicate with a majority group. Recognizing difference actually made these people more likely to trust, feel respected by, and want to communicate with the majority group. So what do we do? What do we do with this information? Well, there's a couple things we can do with it. First, we can promote what's called investiture socialization. I'll give you a quick difference here. 
investiture socialization is when you socialize, when you bring on new employees, you stress the benefits of their unique characteristics. So these are organizations that seek to build on the knowledge, skills, abilities, and other talents associated with a new hire. This is essentially adopting the attitude as an organization of you can help us. Come on in. There are unique qualities that you have, regardless of what gender you are, what race, ethnicity you belong to. We believe that you have something important that can help us here. This is as opposed to divestiture socialization. That's when you stress the importance of a new hire fitting into the organization. Organizations that need people to buy into their way of doing things. Essentially saying, you should be us. Listen, I know you're an individual. I know you've got your own stuff going on. Leave that at the door. When you walk in here, you are this. Multi-level marketing corporations are very well uh, known for doing things like this. Amway in particular, there's some very interesting studies about how they engage in something called sense breaking. And they tell their employees, your individual character, forget about it. When you come here, you're Amway. You buy into our way of doing things. And there are some advantages to that. But if you're looking to promote differences in organizations, you obviously want to invest in investiture socialization, whether that's encouraging people to put up photos of their family and friends and hobbies on their desks, whether it's just having signs up that remind people that you are an important person and we need what you have. These things can be very important. The other is to reframe the value of difference in your own organizations. You want to begin discussing and promoting differences as something you want, not something you need to be careful about. And this is a very subtle difference, but I think it's very, very important. This sends a message to employees that differences are valuable and thus worthy of investigation. And it affords, to some extent, women and minorities entry into positions they're typically excluded from consciously or otherwise. And what do I mean by reframing the value of difference? I mean, going from this attitude of, we need more minorities to hit our quotas. We don't have enough women here, so we need to hire more women. It's less of a, we need to, or we'll get in trouble, and more of a, we need more minorities or we need more women to be competitive. They offer something we don't have. I'll admit personally, as a white man sitting here, I am inherently limited in my knowledge of the world. If you hired me to market a product, I could probably market it to, 20 and 30 something white guys from Boston where I grew up. And yes, I did root for Tom Brady over the weekend and I'm not ashamed of it, but I'm not going to be able to reach certain groups because I am inherently limited. And if you can just find subtle ways to reframe in your organization difference, it's not something we need or we'll get in trouble. It's something we want because it can make us better. Thank you all very much for your time. I include a picture of my son, not me, because he's much cuter. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out and I will stop uh, sharing my screen and mute myself. Thank you guys. Uh, stop share, boom. Well, thank you, Matt. That was fantastic. I learned a lot. I hope everybody else did. Um, now, it, I suppose it is my turn to share my screen. Um, so let's see if I can do that as seamlessly as he did. And that little kid, just so you all know, locked Matt in the basement bathroom. Um, yeah, last week he shared with us. So he might look cute, but he's actually really evil. I was in there for 30 minutes until my wife got home from Target. It was very scary. <laughs> I think every parent probably has um, that sort of a story uh, I do as well, which I won't share with you now, but um, <clears throat> let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Did anybody have questions for Matt while I uh, am technologically challenged here and try to figure out how to share my screen? Sounds like no. Ah, there it is. There's the button. Fantastic. Okay. Can you guys give me a thumbs up if you're seeing my screen? Excellent. Okay. So Matt just gave us all a lot to chew on as far as how to communicate 
um, with people. And I want to take you into um, kind of a uh, where to communicate with people um, in a very real, uh, ongoing, real-time challenge that the city is facing right now. As Danny said, we get to do some fun things like Olympic City USA. Hopefully you all know our uh, city's sesquicentennial is this year. That's our 150th birthday. Those are the fun things to work on. Um, obviously, all of us have been embroiled in COVID for the last year and the uh, need to communicate in a public health crisis um, really brings to light the challenges of communicating across different groups, um, different demographics, especially here, different ages. Um, and I'll borrow kind of the disclaimer that Matt gave that will give some kind of key suggestions here on communicating with different groups. Um, we know that groups are not all the same. And so uh, everything I, I'm trying to paint here with something of a broad brush, um, but we know that that's not always completely foolproof. So the very basic elements of communication that every PR student learns is the who, what, where, when, and how, um, and why, right? So each of these elements of a message is equally important. Um, obviously there's the message, what are you communicating? Who are you trying to talk to? How are you getting it out and where and on what channels? Um, and like Matt just explained to us, how are they gonna best receive your message? So with the vaccine specifically, what are we communicating? There's a huge hunger out there for the basic information. All of you probably have the same questions. Where can I get it? When can I get it? Who should get it? Is it safe? Um, how long will it take? Uh, if you're me or in my demographic, you're probably trying to figure out how do I get it from my parents who are maybe not super tuned in. Um, so that is the, the basic architecture of the message. Now we need to think about who are we communicating to? Well, in the case of a public health crisis, we're communicating to literally everyone um, and that makes it really challenging. But I want to focus on uh, a more challenging um, demographic, seniors, diverse communities, communities of colors and non-English speakers, right? And that kind of just points out that you can't speak in only one way, in only one place. Um, People have different challenges in communication. They might have different levels of trust in government. I think actually, sadly, everyone has a pretty low trust in government right now. There are lots of studies out there that will tell you that. Um, and there are so many places to get information. Um, so much different than when we were all growing up when your parents just turned on the news or grabbed the newspaper. Now we are bombarded by information. Some of it uh, accurate, probably most of it not accurate. So that is its own challenge in the communications industry. So here's just some of those channels and this is not even close to representative of what's out there. Um, we've got social media, we have digital media, uh, we've got all of our typical news channels, we have um, very political news channels. We have some that speak to Democrats, some that speak to Republicans. Uh, and then we still have the old fashioned physical posters, billboards, postcards, um, and so we really need to kind of come up with a mix of all those different communications to reach the broadest possible group. So one trap we all fall into is, well, I put it on Facebook, so didn't you see it? Um, and this is kind of a funny graphic, but it's something that people are so guilty of. Um, maybe you guys, when you're communicating with your publics and marketing to your publics, you're like, well, I put out the advertisement. How come, you know, I, I built it? Why didn't they come? And we like to just think that, well, I put it out on Facebook and I look at Facebook. So of course everybody saw it. And that's just not true. And we got to get ourselves out of those traps, especially when we're talking about um, differing demographics and different groups who are not like us. So here's another um, breakdown of these different communications channels. And I kind of wrote the pluses and minuses. Uh, we love social media, don't we? Because it's free. And even if you advertise, it's extremely cheap. And it takes me two seconds sitting in my pajamas at home to send a message, right? Um, but who am I reaching really? I'm reaching my fans, uh, maybe if they happen to be on Facebook at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. Um, it lacks some credibility. Uh, there is a sea of misinformation out there. 
Um, and so it's certainly has it, its uh, pros, but it definitely has its cons. And then there's the media, right? I put credibility question mark because some people might think, oh yeah, I saw it on the news. It's absolute fact. Um, other people will say, oh, it's fake news and uh, it's slanted. And if you saw it on CNN or you saw it on Fox, depending on your, you know, you, you can't trust that. Um, and then I am a huge fan of uh, physical advertising, which is super old fashioned, but it's making a comeback. Um, it is hyper local, which means you can very, very specifically target groups geographically, um, demographically. It is more expensive. It costs money, obviously, to print mail. Um, in some cases, literally walk around and put up posters in your Starbucks, but um, it does have its, uh, its pros and they're pretty significant. So I wanna specifically talk about seniors because we all know right now that is the group we're trying to target. Um, They're the ones who need the vaccines. They're the ones who can get their vaccines right now. Uh, but again, to Matt's point, this is just my um, Google search of seniors. And the point of the slide is to show how different they are. If you look in the upper right, we got this lady who's giving you the thumbs up. She's driving somewhere. She's super independent. She can get out and get around. In the lower left, you've got this old man who seems to be um, you know, bedridden, maybe not so healthy. Uh, upper left, grandparents talking on Zoom to their grandkids. They're super technologically savvy. Lower right, this guy could be technologically savvy, nothing against farmers, but maybe he lives a very different lifestyle. And so that's just an additional caution when you're looking at groups not to paint them with a broad brush. And I, I, at the risk of preaching, I'm gonna go into that even further here shortly. So one communications channel you did not see on my last slide is informal communications channels. And this is huge to the point that the CDC recommends this as their number one way of um, communicating with people about the vaccine. Personal testimonials are the most trusted communication tool out there. Um, people like to get messages from quote, someone like me, right? We're all guilty of that. Oh, well, my neighbor did it. Oh, well, you know, a woman in my mom's group did it. It must be true. Um, and these could come in a lot of different ways, depending on the person. Uh, you see someone's neighbor out at the mailbox having conversation. Faith leaders are huge and a big target for us in this vaccine communication. Um, hairdressers, especially in uh, the black community are influential. Um, and then, you know, it could be any group you're a part of, your PTA meeting, your homeowner's club, your mom blog. Um, there are any number of informal influences out there that we can take advantage of and who are really, really important. So back to seniors, what are the challenges? Um, any of us can think about our parents, our grandparents. Um, technology is a huge barrier uh, across a lot of different demographics, but especially with seniors. Um, they may or not be able to drive. They may or may not be out in public or comfortable doing it. Um, and we all know they're vulnerable to scams. And so that's an additional challenge that they might not trust you if you call them on the phone or if they see a pop-up ad on their um, internet or Facebook. So technology is getting a lot of bad rap right now. Um, and it's not just in our neighborhood. You can see Tampa Bay uh, struggling Seniors are, uh, depending on their families to get them information about the vaccine and about COVID, I mean, raises the question, what if you don't have family? What if you're not in touch with your family? How are we reaching them? And there's some more, um, even national news talking about computer shy elderly or shoulder to side in the vaccination race, which is really a huge issue since, like I said, that's the priority group right now. And we have gotten to the point where we just don't know how to reach them. We're so technology dependent. We've had to kind of go back in time and reconsider how we communicate with people. So this is a real um, conversation I had with my father. Like I said, I'm, I'm going to give you some personal uh, experience here. Just text Shara Cares to 883-849 and you'll get a text back telling you when you can click the link to log on to an online waiting room. Then when it refreshes a few times and the server isn't overwhelmed, you can create a login and sign up for a vaccine slot. Okay, my dad completely tuned me out at about word three, right? Um, it is a different language and we really need to um, recognize that you can still be speaking English, but guess what? It's not English to certain demographics. So 
I want to talk about, like I said, I'm going to preach a little bit about the differences and uh, even within groups. So here's senior A. Um, this is my mom. She's tech savvy. She gets her news from credible sources. She's educated. She's healthy. She kayaks. Um, she's 75 years old, but she's on it. And she signed up for her text messages. She got an alert. She's had both of her shots. It's great. So how do we talk to my mom? She gets her text. She's on Facebook, checking out her grandkids. She watches the news. She's out at the gym. So she might see a poster. Um, pretty easy to reach senior A slash Jamie's mom. Then there's senior B, Jamie's dad. Um, non-tech savvy, reluctant. It took us an hour to get him on Zoom on Christmas, not joking. Gets his news from talk radio. He is the one person who still listens to talk radio. Um, and these are real conversations. He says, oh, Hank Aaron died from his COVID vaccine. Not true, but he did hear it in the radio. Uh, not that anxious. Talked to our neighbor and uh, he hasn't gotten his yet. Oh, I put down a phone number somewhere I can call. And I'm like, oh my gosh, dad, you're never gonna get your vaccine. You're gonna call somebody, right? Um, so how do we reach senior B? Well, he goes to church, right? That's that informal communication. Like we said, he's talking to his neighbors out at the mailbox. Um, he does watch the news. I should have had a logo for talk radio on there. Uh, and then there's a picture of me and dad. Guess who's signed him up for every single text messaging service. Guess who's up in the morning trying to call and get him an appointment in Florida. Family is huge. And then uh, he goes to a senior center. He could see a poster. He does get his mail. That's that physical advertising is really key for the older uh, generation. And then if you wanna go a little further into um, challenging populations, uh, when it comes to vaccinations, we know that because of inequity in the health system, minority communities are less trusting. Um, they don't think it's, they're, they're afraid it's not safe. They don't want to be the first guinea pig to go get a shot. Um, they might not be connected to media, uh, not used to um, interacting with their government. They're probably not on the city's Facebook page. They're not seeing all those beautiful graphics we put up all the time. And that's when these informal influencers come in really, really huge. Uh, faith leaders, like I said, especially in minority communities, especially in older communities. If you go to church, look around, you probably notice that people are in the older age group. Not a lot of young people at church these days. Um, family, neighbors, physical advertising, also important, and niche marketing. Um, here in Colorado Springs, we have the Southeast Express. It's a new newspaper in the southeast of our city, um, typically a more economically depressed area, but they're probably going to have a little more trust in their community papers versus the Gazette, KOAA, kind of the mass media. So how do we go about it? Well, like I said, influencers, community groups, those engage with a senior community to give personal uh, testimonials, personal messaging, um, a call center. So gosh darn it, my dad can get on the phone and call somebody and speak to a real person. I know you've all heard that. We did set up a call center with 211. And so people can actually talk to somebody that's really comforting, especially with um, topics that demand high trust like a vaccine and public health physical assets, going back in time, using the old fashioned stuff, it's tried and true. Of course, we're doing the media. You may as well cast a wide net and see who you can hit. Faith-based partner communications. We've got um, a huge group of uh, faith leaders in Colorado Springs that help us get message out. Caregivers and family members, like I said, get those people who are a little easier to reach and have them be your messenger. And then if you can measure your reach, it's only going to make you a better communicator. Like I said, we all like to just say, well, I put it out there. Of course, everyone saw it. And we sometimes need to check ourselves and realize that's probably not true. Um, there are different ways, couponing, links, Facebook does do great analytics. Um, and we can ask them, right? For you guys, when your customers come in and speak to you, hey, how'd you hear about us? Find out, learn your audience's habits in advance, and then you're going to be a lot more effective in targeting them in the future. And you can see this graph that even though I've just trashed technology, they're learning. Look, they're, they're picking it up slowly but surely. And so there is hope, even for my dad getting on Zoom on Christmas Eve. So the takeaways, who, how, and where you're communicating are just as important as what you are communicating. The tree falls in the forest, all of that, right? Um, different groups get messages in different ways, as Matt just explained to us. 
And there's no one size fits all approach. Um, we have to be sensitive to the differences in behaviors and preferences uh, and habits. We can't just take the easy button uh, when it comes to tossing something up on, on Facebook. We really need to take time to think about who we're trying to reach and where we're gonna find them. And try a mix. If you don't know what you're doing right now and you're looking at a message to get out, try all different things and then see how they worked. And then say word of mouth's working best for you, then put all your assets into word of mouth. Um, if you find out that your poster out on the garbage can downtown is getting the most reach, then by all means, invest more into the garbage can downtown. And then measure it, like I said, when you can to find out who you're reaching and how you're reaching them. And that's it for me. All right, thanks, Jamie. Um, and thanks, Matt, for your presentations this morning. I have a couple questions here for you. And uh, just a reminder, if anybody has questions, throw them in the chat and I'll ask them out loud. Um, so Matt, question for you. What are your thoughts about personality tests and how they can help with communication by recognizing differences, such as the DISC test or the Myers-Briggs? Great question. Um, so I, I'm not familiar with the DISC test, so I, I can't speak to that. The Myers-Briggs test scientifically is fun, but borderline useless. Um, the Myers-Briggs test was, it, if you're looking for something, feel free to email me at that email I have. There's an assessment called the Hexaco, H-E-X-A-C-O. It measures six different personality dimensions. The reason why I'm not so big on the Myers-Briggs um, is one, because there are people on the board of the Myers-Briggs test that say they, they would be laughed at by their colleagues if they used it in their own research. The second is that the Myers-Briggs does this thing of putting you in a box. And it says you are an introvert or an extrovert. You are this or that. And the truth obviously is that people are more complex than that. What the Hexaco does is it takes something like extroversion and it gives you a score from the first to the 99th percentile. So for instance, my extroversion score I think is about a 0.56 because sometimes I love to be the center of attention in a room. And sometimes at a party, I wanna sneak off and pet the cat or the dog in the other room and not talk to anybody because people are not just one thing or the other thing. So I think that taking something like the Hexaco, it's a 100 question um, survey, especially when it comes to something like extroversion can give you a pretty good metric of how willing people are to come out to you and communicate with you. Um, that was a bit of a rant on, on the Myers-Briggs and the Hexaco, but I think that there is some value there. I think especially if you find somebody to be less conscientious, that's probably the dimension you want to look at. If somebody's scoring very high in conscientiousness, I, I'm a 0.8 something. I, I bet people at this meeting probably score high just by virtue of the fact that you signed up for a meeting like this. You're going to look for information. If you score very low, you're, that you're not concerned with making lists or getting things in order. So those might be the people you need to make more of an effort, effort to reach out to. That would be my two cents. Cool, thanks, Matt. Okay, question for Jamie. Um, and some of this you may have answered a little, but what are some of your goals for vaccination messaging? In addition to monitoring how many seniors are getting vaccinated, how can you determine if you're reaching your target audience? That's a great question. So we tried to make our communications goals really simple. Um, the vaccine is safe, it's available, and um, you can get it basically, or when you can get it uh, more accurately. So we're trying to keep it so simple, just knowing that um, while we live in the weeds of you know variants and all this different stuff, we really just need to get people such top line messaging that they can contact their provider, they can get there and they can get um, vaccinated. As far as measuring it, which I just talked about, uh, it's really difficult. Um, we are relying heavily on our partners, the vaccine providers to get back to us and let us know how the message is resonating. Um, and and the, the person who asked the question hit it right on the head, uh, the best, indicator we have is the number of people that are getting out there and getting the shots. Um, right now, we know that every vaccine clinic has been completely full. And so whether that's our communication, honestly, it's probably more their communication direct to people via email lists, um, phone calls, et cetera. Um, 
but that's the best indicator on uh, whether we're getting it out there. If we get to the point where we have a drive-in clinic like we do um, coming up next weekend and there's no line of cars, then I know there's a real problem. But right now um, there's enough demand uh, that we are getting the response we need. And so I think that's our best measure of success. Yeah, I agree, Jamie. Um, just an interesting comment. I'm in a Rotary Club and some of the Rotarians were saying that they already got their vaccine. And I was thinking, oh, well, I'm, that's cool that they know where to seek out that information because I didn't see anything about it. But so you guys must be doing something right over there. if They're getting that. So um, question for Matthew, when you see majority group assimilation being encouraged in meetings, et cetera, what are some ways we can encourage value of different perspectives? That's a great question because I think that the way not to do it is the, you know, and, and this might seem obvious, but to say, hey, I noticed that you don't look like me. Tell me about your culture. You know, that's a little blunt and a little forward. I think that it's not necessarily something that you do in a meeting setting. It's something that you can build into your organization before that meeting even happens by doing things like, encouraging difference. It's such a small thing. And I know it might seem completely insignificant, but encouraging people to put up photos of their hobbies, interests, family, things like that on their desks in their workspaces. Um, if somebody wants to talk about a particular topic, talking about that particular topic with them, I, I think it's, and the, probably the most blunt you can get with it is letting people know before any meeting happens that there's a norm in these meetings that if you have something to say, we want to hear it. And it doesn't matter who it comes from. Because oftentimes in meetings, the less powerful people won't speak up. Because even if you say, listen, we want to hear from you. When that person speaks up, they're ignored, or they're told that their opinion isn't important, or they just move on from it. And that person then learns, okay, what they say is different from what they mean. So by telling people, we want to hear from you, but then also when they do, acknowledging it, thanking them for it, I wasn't thinking about it in that way, that's a way that you can get someone who might have a great idea who works at this level to effectively challenge someone who works at this level to make the organization better. So it's not just about setting the norm, but it's about following through with that norm. Thank you, Matt. And I'm I assume this question's for you, but Jamie also can chime in. Mm -hmm. um, why do people not use empathetic communication more? Is it seen as a sign of weakness? If you want me to take the, the lead on that, I think yes. Um, when I teach my uh, more specific, and I'm happy to share with you anything from my class on uh, verbal, nonverbal communication. I, I talk about the use of something called humble inquiry. Humble inquiry is where regardless of what your position is in the organization, you approach someone from a position of humility and say, I could really use your help on this. So it doesn't matter if you're the CEO, if you need help on something, you'll approach someone below you and say, below you in the hierarchy at least, and say, I could really use your help on this project. You have more expertise than me, please help out. Or even if you are the expert to say, I think we should do this, but maybe I'm missing something. So if you guys have any ideas, could you help me out? That's rare, I think, because people, once they gain status, are afraid to lose status. And it does, as you say, make people look less powerful. When you speak, we're taught, if we want to sound powerful, to speak authoritatively and with conviction and to get rid of things like, but maybe, I think, I don't know, we want to eliminate that from our conversation. And I'm, I don't think we should bring all that right back in, but you know, if you have a, if you're the external consultant and you go into the organization and you say, I think based on my experience that we should do X, but I'm not familiar with this organization. Obviously you guys know a lot more than I do. So what am I missing? I think those small steps can really make people feel empowered and make people feel like they're valuable. But I think you hit the nail on the head. People don't do it because we're afraid to look weak. Jamie, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, I would just say that uh, in politics, empathetic communication is probably very effective um, and probably something we don't do enough. Um, I'm taking some notes off of what, what Matt's talking about here. Um, but like I said, kind of relating to people in a way um, 
that doesn't come off as so authoritarian and so kind of sterile and impersonal um, is really important, especially on messages that are so sensitive surrounding things like crises, public health, uh, economic struggles. Um, and so I think we get in a rush and we want to sound authoritative and we need to in a way to build trust but um there is a lot of value in relating to people kind of where they are and recognizing um different struggles and and even i think especially with covid there has thankfully become a little bit of a tolerance of recognizing that we don't know what we don't know um recognizing that maybe we've gotten it wrong a couple times and, and i don't mean the city of Colorado Springs, although I'm sure we have, but nationally, right? How many times have we gone back and forth on masks, no masks? Um, you know, it's it's spread by touch, it's spread by air, etc. And so I I think that I I almost look at the empathy, um, empathetic communication in a way of humanizing. And I think that that is something that, especially in politics and government, um, we could do a lot better. Great points. So we're, we have one minute left. Jamie, do you have anything you want to say to wrap us up? And then Matt, if you want to go. Um, just thanks everybody for jumping online. I'm certainly happy to answer um, any questions. I think you guys will share my email. I'm happy to share the presentation. Um, this was just such a small corner of a communication. So thanks for letting me kind of geek out on the topic I love. I would echo that, uh, Jamie's thanks. Thank you, Jamie, for uh, co-hosting this with me. Thank you, Emma and the EDC for all your work. Thank you, everyone who attended here. I think that this is, if the goal of these sessions is to, you know, at least from my perspective, disseminate some research into the practical world, I think it does that. It also gives us an opportunity to take some messages, put them out into the world, and hopefully, you know, they find some traction. We, we have a lot of great problems that we have to overcome as a society. And I think one way that we can start doing that is by just making people aware of things like differences and how to reach certain people and, and the value of those people. And I think these meetings do a great job of doing that. So thank you for helping put this together. Yeah, thank you, Jamie and Matt. And one or two quick plugs for the chamber. Um, we have our next business briefing is in two months and it will be about leading no matter what level you are at in your organization. So be sure to check that out. It should be a really good event and you'll see that in our newsletter. And the other thing I wanna mention is just because we spoke a lot about diversity and differences today, we do have a diversity in the workplace committee. If you are interested in joining or learning more about that, they're really working on a lot of actionable things to make changes in this community. And um, I'm leading that committee. So please shoot me an email if you're interested to learn more. Anyway, thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day and thanks for joining us today. Thanks everyone.